conceptual perspective. Talk about Dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Everybody, it's Dr. Rick here dropping in on you. We're here for the third installment of the series Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery, which is uh, me reading excerpts from my 19th book, Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. It is the expression of, it is a written expression of literally a couple of decades of research into uh, a number of different uh, pathological behaviors, a number of different inexplicable uh, behaviors, the, the desire to understand multi-generational transmission of trauma, which was being rebutted and pushed back on by a number of different uh, group uh, think groups. And so it was important for me to study it, to understand it so that I could provide solution uh, intervention methods and mechanisms and so much more for the people I identify with and I love, uh, the black race. And so I'm going to read an excerpt off here. Uh, this is going to be installment number three, and we're going to be going through this for a while. I'm going to try to keep this excerpts short uh, so that I don't bore people. Some people, you know, um, they need it compact. And I want to make sure I reach as many people. If you want the book, you can get the book individual. The individual link is there. It's also right now a part of a seven, seven book bundle of my top uh, most requested uh, titles. But uh, this is the beginning of chapter eight that I'm going to read from chapter eight, racial trauma and African-Americans, African-Americans understanding how racial trauma impacts them. Okay, a substantial amount of my research and studies have been dedicated to understanding the collective dysfunctionality of African Americans. I have analyzed and developed theories to explain the behavior of African Americans as it pertains to the general inability to effectively respond to opportunities in life or guard against the nefarious and pestilential machinations that are designed to perpetuate a standard, perpetuate a substandard of existence for us. I have invested much uh, into the understanding of the influence of cognitive distortions and cognitive biases on the social mobility and pathological behavior of a large portion of the African-American community. In addition to anatomizing the paradigms of post-traumatic slave syndrome, I have developed several theories that rest along the lines of cognitive theory. The first theory I developed was collective cognitive bias reality syndrome theory which is a theory that seeks to explain the way cognitive distortions influence how blacks think, process stimuli, form habits, and behave through a systematic process of deviated rationalization serving to create a reality that is repugnant to the one thing that they seek. Subsequently, I developed the cognitive dominative I, I, excuse me I developed the collective dominative cognitive bias theory to explain the dominance of the influence distorted con cognitions in gov governing the entire existence of a significant number of African Americans most re recently 
I developed the cognitive assimilation deficiency theory and the cognitive accommodation deficiency theory to explain the inability of African Americans to successfully engage neoteric stimuli that they perceive to be a threat. What I have discovered during the process of my work is that there is a common denominator that cannot be ignored. That common denominator is trauma. The birth of three new branches of science has led to a recent explosion of knowledge about how the effects of psychological trauma impact humans. These new schools of scientific study are neuroscience, the study of how the brain supports mental processes, developmental psychology, the study of the impact of adverse experiences on the development of mind and brain, and interpersonal neurobiology, the study of how our behavior influences the emotions, biology, and mindsets of those around us. What we now know is that trauma, regardless of type or origin, compromises the brain area that communicates the natural, physical, embodied feeling of being alive. These changes in the brain explain why traumatized individuals become hypervigilant in perceiving threats at the expense of being able to live their lives in a spontaneous manner. These changes also help us understand why traumatized people so often keep repeating the same problems and why they have such trouble learning from experience. What was once believed to be the results of moral failings, signs of the lack of willpower or bad character, is due to the changes in the brain caused by traumatic experiences. The principal aim of psychology is to develop an understanding of the individual variation in the functioning of humans using broad hypotheses, theories, and research that is capable of not only explaining the variations in human behavior, but creating the mechanisms and instruments through which we can predict poor behavior to intervene in a manner that palliates or even reverses the behavior. While the average person will view variation in human behavior as coincidence or an abstract anomaly, the psychologist and the inherent analytical thinker always believes that there is a discoverable, discoverable and measurable explanation for every occurrence. While we may not always be able to readily identify the origin of the behavior, we understand that causality is discoverable. When it comes to the counterproductive and antisocial behavior of African Americans, it, is, it, it, it has been the common practice to study it as a pathological behavior. In other words, it has most commonly been examined under the model of psychopathology. However, I have discovered that while pathology must be investigated when studying and developing treatments for antisocial behavior, the trauma model, which does not place an emphasis on pathology, is able to explain both poor and pulmonary responses. To stressful and traumatic events. Additionally, the trauma model also offers suggestions about the best methods of intervention to efficaciously, efficaciously address and improve functionality after a traumatic event. More importantly, the majority of these intervention models are cost-effective and non-stigmatizing. When I, when I pick up this again, we're going to go into understanding the trauma model. So we're literally going to break down and explain what trauma is. Uh, what it does to the mind, the brain, and the body, uh, the biological processes of experiencing trauma, uh, the psychological process of recovering from trauma, and we're going to do that in the next reading. Uh, I want to give you some insight. The reason I'm sharing the reading from this particular book, and I'm going to do some readings from other books, but the reason I'm sharing the readings from that book, again, it is Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because I think it's important that we understand that what we deal with isn't coincidence. It's not happenstance. It's not moral failure. Uh, we're not stupid. Um, there are so many different suggestions as to why blacks can't climb out of the hole. There are so many different suggestions as to why blacks have opportunities that they can't seem to grasp or they seem to be in a holding pattern of dysfunctional and counterintuitive and counterproductive behavior. And what we don't do is discuss why. We don't talk about multi-generational trauma as much anymore. We, you know, we don't talk about the biological influence. We don't talk about why so many blacks are hypervigilant uh, when it comes to the perception of threat. 
and why we become uh, hyper aware when we are around different types of people, certain types of people, police, um, you know, Caucasians, a number of different things, and uh, why we lack trust. All of these things are tied into this behavior, and until we are able to understand it and deal with it, we can't just say we know what's wrong with it, because it's not something you can say, okay, I know it's there, and it goes away. Uh, it's beyond that. There's a need to address it on a subconscious level, and that's something that we are going to have to do. It's something that I have spent years upon years developing processes. Uh, socialization for young boys so that we create stronger black men that aren't so susceptible to emotional collapse. Uh, also, uh, developing uh, senses of awareness and responsibility early on also a number of different treatments for traumatic injury we have to realize that we went through 246 years of child slavery uh, we were released but we were never treated for this compounded uh, infraction upon our spiritual emotional psychological health and physical health we never we, we never got that and so we went into an entire different reality of more perpetuated trauma. We had 12 years of reconstruction where the South just really truly reconstructed itself after the North pulled out. Um, we had clandestine groups like the Klans and others that were riding and, and, and we, we were actually more likely to be killed after we released because we didn't have the same value to our owners, our former owners uh, as freemen as we did as slaves and property. And so we went through that. We went through uh, years of black code. We went through convict leasing. We went through sharecropping. We went through um, 70 plus years of Jim Crow segregation. We went through redlining, benign neglect. We went through uh, miseducation. We went through incarceration at a rapidly imp uh, increasing rate and it's still increasing those are some of the things then we were held at bay for numerous from numerous different ways with the war against black wealth there has been so much that we have experienced that lend to our collective biases in the way that we respond to certain stimuli and until we have a, a grasp on that and we develop collective and universal ways of addressing it it will still be a problem and so I just wanted to give you some insight onto some of the pros approaches that I use and some of the things I talk about uh, on the surface where my I ideologies come from where my philosophies come from uh, what have I done in years to afford me the ability to speak from a platform of expertise on it and so we're going to spend some more time in born in captivity uh, again if you want to get the book as an individual uh purchase you can get that link is in there if you want to buy it as a part of the bundle uh, the link for the bundle is also in the description box on that note i am out of here thank you guys for stopping in <laughs> Thank you.